The words variety and diversity are very appropriate at the Milwaukee Municipal Nursery. Located in the southern part of the county in the city of Franklin, the nursery and its greenhouses have been providing trees, flowers, plants, and shrubs for more than 60 years. Yeah, there's about 60 variety of trees that we have out at the Municipal Nursery uh, and hundreds of varieties of uh, annual flowers and perennials. These are selected so that they're hardy and they're resistant to insect and disease problems, but hardy for Milwaukee's uh, summers and some, some species are drought resistant. But uh, mostly for, with regard to flowers, our annual flowers and our perennials, they're showy. They provide visual interest to residents and it's an important part of Milwaukee's culture uh, to continue to have our boulevards uh, attractively landscaped. Milwaukee's boulevards are among the recipients of the nursery's green thumb. The project covers over 120 miles of boulevards, some 200,000 annuals, 5,000 perennial flowers, and several thousand trees and shrubs are planted annually at various city sites. Well, with regard to flowers, our flower season really begins planting with our crews in the greenhouses, dividing flowers, putting seeds in trays in about November and December. We then um, uh, put them out into the greenhouse, continue to water and fertilize them, and start moving those plants out onto the boulevards around Memorial Day, which is traditionally uh, throughout America the largest planting day around the country as well. So we're no different in that regard. So we move them out of the greenhouses around the end of May. We have two tree planting seasons, one in the spring and one in the fall. Uh, we harvest our spring, uh, we harvest in the spring uh, around March and April, and we try to finish up about uh, May 15th. And we plant both trees that are bald and burlapped, uh, uh, those trees that have a ball on the bottom of them wrapped in burlap. We also plant bare root trees that don't have a ball on the end of them, just have their root system. We also harvest trees in the fall, and that's usually happening around the end of October, last week of October, and runs through Thanksgiving. So we have two planting seasons. And in the summertime, right about now, uh, we're about to um, plant out our tree whips. And those whips are small trees that after about four to seven years, depending on the species, we then harvest in the spring or fall so that we can outplant them on, uh, in front of residents, in front of businesses, as well as on the boulevard. But what we do is only a small percentage. So we try to uh, interest citizens into continuing to plant trees on their own property. Uh, we manage about 20% of Milwaukee's urban forest. 80% is on private property. And so we do have an impact, and our impact is to educate citizens and also to give them uh, information about proper tree planting and tree care. So we do a lot of things in terms of educating the public about urban forest as well. It's a tangible benefit because well, we feel that it's important that businesses relocate here, and we also feel that residents in, choose to stay in Milwaukee because of its boulevard system. Uh, we think that individuals who travel along those boulevards, whether they're city residents or not, tend to appreciate those kinds of things. So we quantify that in terms of asking them uh, questions with regard to surveying them. And time and time again, they've said that it's beautiful, it's pleasing, and they would be willing to pay part of their tax dollar to continue to have this kind of uh, infrastructure. As mentioned earlier, Milwaukee's residency requirement is not enforced for one city employee, the nursery manager. Jan Grahoski is our nursery uh, manager and uh, supervisor, and he is the only resident that's allowed to live outside the city. Because we have millions of dollars of plant material out here at the nursery, I mean, we could spend a fortune to have a person here, a uh, security guard, for example, but he lives on the grounds um, in a house provided by the city, and when alarms go off, much like uh, happen occasionally in the wintertime when the boiler system shuts down for some reason, it's important to have him here. The nursery also provides some revenue for the city. Its products are not sold to the public, but are sold to other governmental agencies. It's an important quality of life issue for residents and visitors. It's a tradition that's been started back in since 1938 where, uh, again, the forefathers had the vision to purchase land so that the city can continue to provide the plant material necessary to beautify the city on its boulevards and trees in front of residents and the boulevards. Uh, and that vision is continuing with uh, the new greenhouses. We uh, erected new greenhouses in uh, 1996 and um, what we're able to do is increase the amount of plant material that we can produce. Things are automated, things are effectively um, uh, logistically set up so that our crews that work out here 
have an opportunity to continue to produce a high quality product in a short time frame at low cost. The scene and the sounds outside the Milwaukee Central Library could have been from another time. But inside, the time was the present. The sounds, those of excitement, as kids and parents waited impatiently to see the new children's room. And this is one of the proudest days in the history of the Milwaukee Public Library. And you're going to see why as soon as you get through those doors. With son Ben on his shoulders, Mayor John Norquist cut through the ribbon and gift wrapping at the entrance. Visitors are greeted by a book, not a normal one, but a giant book, 11 feet tall, displaying quotes from children's classics. The big book gives a sense of literacy and reading, which we want very much for the children to know. We have the largest collection of books in the state of Wisconsin here, and so that the uh, animals are spotlighted and the children can jump from one to another. They're progressively lit so that children can follow the spotlight into the room. And when you get to the room, then you see the length of the room. The room is about three quarters the size of a football field. It's designed to blend 100 years of architectural history with the technology of the present. Central to the new room's decor is a denim blue linoleum floor with 31 colorful animal shapes created by Milwaukee native Lois Ehlert. This is the first time I've ever designed a floor, and it took me a little time to get used to the idea that people were going to walk on my artwork. <laughs> but uh, please, enjoy. She also says it's her upside down cysteine ceiling, <laughs> which I love. But she pulled together on that floor ways for children to really enter the room and know at once it's theirs. I think this is a wonderful combination of the past, the present, and the future. We've had four people at, that I've talked to that have come in and said, I want to live here. And what they're really saying is it's warm, it's cozy, it's the kind of place I want to stay in, and that's what we want. I think that we have touches here that really make you say, this is a children's room. This is for children, and that's what we want. We have 30 computers. 25 of them are for children at the table height that most adults can use. We will have five for preschool, 20 some inches off the floor, so the very, very youngest have their own. We feel there are many children in the city who do not have computers. Technology is what is going to happen. We have games on the computers that allow children to have eye-hand coordination, which is very important for reading and for writing skills. We have reading on the computers. So it isn't so much technology for games as much as it is that we've looked at the games and made sure that what is on there allows children to begin to read. We also have a small room that is just inside the entrance. It's a small theater. Uh, it accommodates videos. It has a 60-inch screen on it so that the children can really see it. Uh, it also will accommodate flannel board stories, so we'll be able to do that. We look at that room as something families can share together. The Lighthouse is an interesting combination because I think it is a it, it's where people gathered in the early century, and of course this room is 100 years old. Uh, and so we have that, and at the other end of the room we have a wonderful window that was in the original children's room 100 years ago. So it's kind of fun to have all three. When the library was first built, they already had children in mind when they built it. Uh, but now this fully expresses what they wanted to be back then. Not only is the room designed to be used by children through age 14, they also had a hand in planning it. Ten youngsters ages 6 to 14 worked with library staff on an advisory committee. They advised us on computers and what kinds of things they'd like to see in the room. Um, we had a comment book in the central children's room so that any child could tell us what they thought of the room. We had a model and we wanted to know what they wanted to see. So children did have a part in this room and we're really pleased about that. The new children's room 
the library to accommodate a greater range of activities. And it's hoped the new room will encourage families, schools, and community groups to regard the Central Library as a downtown destination. I think this will attract many, many children. We have a lot of families who use this, and unlike other uh, city libraries, central libraries, we have a neighborhood here. So we have a lot of kids who use this as their neighborhood library, but we're attracting many, many families within the city and suburbs, actually, who come to at night and on weekends. So we have a, an eclectic mix, which is really fun, of children who use it. The $2.4 million makeover of the space formerly occupied by Discovery World Museum included $900,000 in city funds, the rest from private donations. When two very hot days are joined with hot nights and high humidity, we have a dangerous situation where the body has problems cooling itself. The combination can cause heat exhaustion, sunstroke, even death. Being prepared for the problem is the job of the Heat Health Task Force, made up of numerous government and private agencies. The group has been around for a number of years, but learned a lot from the severe heat wave of 1995. We learned uh, who was at higher risk. Uh, we learned uh, a lot more about the community resources that we all share that can help respond to that kind of an emergency. In summer's heat, it takes the temperature and humidity to tell the whole story. Meteorologists have started to use the term heat index as an estimate of how hot the weather seems to be. The index, similar to winter's wind chill factor, is used to determine when to issue a heat advisory. It'll be issued when the forecasters do have a high level of confidence that it's going to occur, in the, in, and uh, that's when we do expect the, the 105 uh, degree index for three or more hours during the day and 80 degrees at night. Um, that'll be issued within 24 hours of the, of the uh, expected onslaught. On the index, any value greater than 105 is considered hazardous. As an example, if the temperature is 90, the humidity is 70 percent, the index is 106. An excessive heat warning is issued when the index reaches 115. Most healthy people can tolerate a lot of heat. Uh, and most people recognize when it's time to go cool off. But there's a number of people who are either frail or can't recognize what to do. And that includes the elderly, uh, that includes infants and young children who, whose parents are making their decisions for them. Uh, it includes people who are on certain kinds of medication who may not really know that, about, that the heat is, bother, is, is getting ready to hurt them. It includes, to a lesser extent, uh, athletes or workers who are uh, overdoing it in the heat. But for the most part, it's the elderly and people with various types of disabilities who are at the greatest risk. How can you beat the heat? Outdoor cooling options include county park pools, beaches, and wading pools. Cover windows to keep direct sun out. Spend some time in the basement, an air-conditioned library, or public building. Drink plenty of water or juice. Avoid heavy meals and alcohol. It's most important to pay attention to heat alerts and think of those who may need help. If you know that there's somebody old next door or somebody who has certain disabilities and you're not sure they're okay, check in. If you're still not sure they're okay, call the health department or another agency to have it checked out. Isolated, elderly, or disabled people can get a daily phone call during heat or other emergencies to make sure they're doing okay. Each of our contract agencies um, has a list of people that they consider frail and when there is a heat emergency what happens is that their staff start to call those people that they have registered to make sure that they're okay, that they have adequate food, that they have shelter and that they're, they're doing all right. After the windstorm, we did use our frail elderly list to call everyone that was on it to make sure they had power and had food that hadn't spoiled or that kind of thing. So. This really goes beyond heat, and I think it's a good thing. The task force says there is no one emergency source for fans or air conditioners, and air conditioners aren't always the best solution. It puts a great drain on the energy system, which threatens an energy blackout sometimes when it's very hot. Second of all, people often can't install an air condition in, in the middle of a heat emergency. Their electrical system may not even be able to tolerate it. And thirdly, 
there are cheaper and easier ways to do it that preserve resources for everybody. Water is a great alternative. In fact, a dip in the pool, a cool bath, or a shower will cool better than an air conditioner. Officials say the Milwaukee area is in a better position to deal with heat emergencies because of the task force. The health department, with its few employees, can only do so much. What this group does is the health department can put out an alert based on weather information and suddenly voluntary organizations like the Red Cross and the Salvation Army are going into, uh, going into action. The block groups that the police are in contact with, the elder visitors that the County Office of Agent, uh, Aging is working with, the, the mental health agencies who are dealing with people with, with thought disorders or other mental health problems who may be at risk, uh, we can trigger the network. So yes, we're in a, I think we're in a good position to respond. The Milwaukee area has a great deal to offer cyclists. There are approximately 181 miles of bikeways, 35 of them on off-street trails, another 146 bicycle routes along the streets of Milwaukee. In 1993, the Common Council approved a bicycle plan for the city. It's more than just a recreational plan, it is a, it is a commuting plan. However, the important element, an important uh, part of, of the quality of life issues in the city of Milwaukee is a recreational component of the plan, so it does have both. The adopted plan also called for establishment of a permanent task force to advise the city on how best to implement the bicycle plan. It includes five citizen members and representatives of the Public Works Department and Safety Commission. The makeup of our group is very diverse. It's a nice uh, cross-section. We have people that have expertise in analyzing infrastructure, for example. We have other people who are involved in um, education issues, uh, public education issues, so that they can look at the city plan and say, how are we going to communicate this to everyone? The Bicycle Task Force takes an active role in promoting bicycle commuting, such as the June 5th Bike to Work Day. The annual ride ended with a rally at Pier Marquette Park. There, the city unveiled its new Bicycle Milwaukee map, showing bike lanes, routes, and trails throughout the city. So we have developed a, a stress analysis that takes into account volumes, existing use of, of, of the street by the neighbors and the business communities, its width, is there enough room for, for bicycles to, to travel comfortably, and, and that's the type of engineering analysis that went into developing the plan. There's more and more expected from a, you know, a, a street system, if you will, um, in terms of auto traffic. So looking at ways to help alleviate some of that pressure on the system is important. I mean, it is very much a safety issue. Um, it's, a, it's a quality of life issue if you look at biking strictly as recreational opportunity. Um, and it's a choice issue in terms of, you know, how does a person choose to, to commute back and forth to work? The map also shows bike parking spots. They consist of both bike racks and bike lockers. Okay, you never want to stop with just one brake. You have to use both brakes. The back Setting up bicycle safety measures is another responsibility of the task force. Milwaukee police officers usually implement those measures, providing tips on riding safely, like maintenance and city laws. Well, they're supposed to be licensed and properly equipped with uh, all the safety features, good brakes. When you get a bicycle licensed, it's to be inspected to see that it does have, you need reflectors, uh, a light if you're going to operate in the uh, darkness. Officer Barr says no one should ride without a helmet. Should you fall off the bicycle, even if you're standing still, you're falling, uh, as I say, uh, five to six feet to the and if you land on your head, it's certainly going to save you possibly a concussion, if not quite a few stitches in your head. Uh, you can still get injured with it, but you're not basically going to be injured to quite the severity you would if you didn't have anything on there. Thousands of bikes are not licensed in Milwaukee, but should be for both the identification of the rider in case of an accident and if the bike is stolen. This is uh, a year that's a new registration. They're good for four years. They cost five dollars. The uh, serial number of the bicycle is then recorded. Should your bicycle be stolen, it could be returned to you. Uh, 
Uh, you've always heard of the big police auctions where they have all these hundreds of bicycles. The only reasons we have so many bicycles is because no one can claim them and we don't know who to give them to. If these bicycles would have been registered in the first place, we know who an owner may be. Bicycles are classified as vehicles under Wisconsin and Milwaukee laws with the same rights to the road. But many ignore those laws, such as riding on the sidewalk. It's only legal for police and youngsters under 10. But they can be cited just like an automobile for going through stop signs, going through red lights, uh, riding on the wrong side of the road, uh, driving the wrong way on a, on a one way. Uh, these are all, you have to follow the rules of the road. Task Force members provide input to any project with bicycle use impacts, including proposals for Lincoln Memorial Drive and the Henry Aaron State Park Trail in the Menominee Valley. Future goals include more off-road trails in the city, as well as advocating increased bicycle use through education. And we've identified our three primary goals as education, advocacy, and, and looking at facilities. The education part is probably the easiest one, you know, how do we get the word out to people that um, A, the city is working on um, a bike plan, that routes are being uh, developed continuously. 